it's such a pleasure to be here today with you. I apologize for any delay in speech. I feel like I'm still kind of in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I'm getting caught up because there's like such tremendous energy here and it's, I'm just so pleased to be here. So I'm gonna start in a place I don't normally start, but maybe I should with the title. So the title, particularly when there's a printed program, I'm reluctant to change it. But I had some time to think while I was on the plane, and I had some time to read while I was on the plane. And one of the things I read was the program for the conference. This is something, you know, makes sense to do before you arrive. And there was something that I read in it that sort of resonated with me and resonated with the types of things that I was going to talk about anyways. And so I changed the title from Creativity is for Everybody to From Unaware to Everywhere, Young People as Designers of Interactive Media. So I'm really, like, obsessed with this unaware. And I think it speaks a bit to what Steve Ferber was just talking about and is in your program. So computing in recent decades has transformed the way we communicate work and play. It's just, we like the obvious. Yet most people are unaware how broad and exciting the field of computing is. And this, this idea of being unaware was really powerful to me. So why are people unaware? And I'm particularly preoccupied with young people. Why are they unaware? And I argue that a lot of people, particularly young people, they're unaware of how broad and exciting it is because they engage primarily as consumers of computing. So what would it mean to shift and this is probably preaching to the choir a bit, from a consumption model to a model where young people are designers, producers, creators of the interactive technologies they're, they're engaged with. So this idea of empowering people to be creators is something that resonates well with the place I'm from. So as Simon mentioned, I'm a student at MIT Media Lab, and it's a fun place. They're doing all sorts of interesting things, designing cars of the future, designing prosthetics of the future, designing robots of the future. But there's also a strong research agenda around empowering people as creators. So one group, for example, Leah Beakley's group, Hilo Tech, is really interested in making electronics more accessible to people. And so she's looking at combining electronics with textiles or fashion. Empowering people of creators is also like a core mission of the research group that I'm a part of, Lifelong Kindergarten. And so we are developing technologies and developing environments that enable people of all ages, particularly young people, to have creative learning experiences. So oftentimes people are like, what's up with kindergarten? Why, <laughs> what's with the name Lifelong Kindergarten? And so, so much of that is about what we think is wonderful about kindergarten. So I don't know if this maps is the kindergarten here as well. Is that what you call it? Yeah, so you, we know what. Okay, we got that. <laughs> so what's great about kindergarten? Turn to your neighbor. Say hi to your neighbor. What was good about that experience? What is special about kindergarten? Say hi. You can talk. <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's come back together. Okay, wow, that was much more orderly than I anticipated. Okay, does anyone want to share? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we were saying that it's the freedom. Freedom. Fun. 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 You can be messy. You can be messy. No rules that you are aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, that you are aware of yet. yet. Yes. yes. Imagination, learning through play. Imagination, learning through play. This is great. Anyone else? Yes. Bored. <laughs> Bored in kindergarten. Okay, too much structure apparently at an early age. <laughs> yes? Creative. Being creative. Being creative. Being creative. Yes. So this, these are all great things. And I'm going to sort of spin off of the create. What do you need to create? You often need materials. And one thing that, you know, maybe there are moments of boredom for me in kindergarten, but there was also just like enormous access to resources. You had clay, you had sand, you had paint, you had crayons, you had basically the world was your oyster where, you know, you're sort of still in a room, but you have access to all of these interesting materials. Now, what we're really interested in lifelong kindergarten is getting that sense of play, of that freedom, of that creativity where computation becomes a medium just like paint, just like sand, just like clay. So how can you create and be expressive with these materials? And so this is not a new research agenda at the Media Lab. 
you know, if we go, we're getting in the time machine, we're going back to the late 1960s. And so there was a strong sense of enabling kids to interact, to express themselves through computation. So my advisor is Mitch Resnick. His advisor was Seymour Papert. And Seymour Papert, seeing these phenomenal machines, these multi, multi, multi-million dollar computers, said, obviously, what we should be doing with these computers is giving them to children obviously. And so, you know, things like logo, things like the floor turtle came out of that. So if people thought in empowering kids to program, you know, in the modern day is kind of a crazy thing. Think about what the reaction might have been in the late 1960s. So we're in the time machine again. We're spinning forward 20 to 30 years. And so that idea of empowering people to create, empowering young people to create with computation is taken to robotics. So robotics doesn't need to be this elite space that is only accessible to sort of like an elite few. What happens if you could make it accessible to kids? What if kids could build robots? So we worked with the Lego company to develop the Mindstorms robotics kit, which was released, and more than a million kits have been sold. And so we were really excited by the ways in which it was taken up. You know, you've got kids participating in, you know, Mindstorms robotics competitions. They're building, they're being creative, they're creating. This is great. But if you look at the way it was packaged, how many people have seen the Lego Mindstorms robotics kit box? Okay, a fair number. So if you, if you remember, particularly the first generation, it was a blue box, it had lightning bolts, you could build a monster thing, you could build a digger thing. It was positioned in a very particular way. And so the group said, how could we take this same idea, you've got a small computer, you've got four types of input, four types of output, but then you add craft materials. What would happen if you had these technology components and treated them like craft components and added googly eyes and pom-poms and pipe cleaners? What sorts of things could you create live from Cambridge, Massachusetts? I bring you Mange Cat. I don't know if you can see it all the way in the back. Um, so you can create different types of things than the thing you can dig with. So I'm going to fire this up. What do cats like? Cats like to be pet. So when I pet the cat. <laughs> and so again, you know, it expands the range of things you can do. And I've just written a simple program that there's a light sensor. It's not actually detecting touch. When the light goes below a certain level, it plays the kitten sound. So again, I can make a kitten. I can make a birthday cake. I can make whatever I want. But again, why can't we just treat computational materials like any other sort of creative craft material? And so kids create a wide range of things with the Pico Cricket Kit. This is a commercial kit that's been out in the world. Um, so this was a girl in Taiwan who created light-up shoes with the Pico Cricket Kit. This young man created a jukebox with Pico Crickets. This girl was tired of her brother breaking into her room and reading her diary, so she created a door alarm. So no matter what you're creating, you're engaged in a process a process that we call in our group the creative learning spiral. And so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't read this too literally. So there are multiple stages, and you can go between them. The idea is it's iterative, these iterative creative design processes. So you start with an idea. You imagine what's possible. You actually engage in building it. You test it out. You share it with a friend. You reflect on your experiences, and then you start all over again. So it's this idea that it's not a, you start, you end. They're just waypoints, things to experiment with. And so this was a picture of a boy at a workshop in Iceland, a Pico Crickets workshop in Iceland. And so they were charged with, do something interesting with the Pico Cricket kit. And he's like, OK, what is a problem that I face that maybe the Pico Cricket kit could help me with? And he said, well, I have a really hard time getting out of bed in the morning. Don't we all? Maybe some people here don't. I, I did this morning. So what did he do? He created an alarm system. So when the light comes in through his window, the light detector senses that, starts up the motor, and it ruffles his hair as a way of getting him out of bed. I thought that was really clever. And so he was really excited about it, and he showed his friend. And his friend was like, OK, this is pretty cool. This is working quite nicely. Um, but you know, we're in Iceland, and it kind of gets dark here in the winter. Uh, so the whole idea of light coming in in the morning isn't going to really work for part of the year. 
And so he was a little, the creator was a little dejected. And so he went off and said, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And they had a demo day. And everyone is waiting, you know, taking their turn, showcasing their project. And he's sitting there and everyone's sort of looking and it's like, this looks like the same project. And he's, he gets up and he's got a little blanket over part of the project and he lifts it up and right there at the front of the project there's a little sign that says, for export only. <laughs> So it's a way of dealing with challenges. You know, how do you creatively deal with design challenges? That's just one way. There are other strategies. But no matter what you're doing, you're engaged in this process of designing and creating. So we were really excited by all of the things with Mindstorms and with Pico Crickets. But a challenge of something like this is as soon as you have hardware, it starts to get expensive, right? So the Mindstorms kit is 250 US dollars. Even this is you know, several hundred US dollars. So we wanted something that would enable a broad section of people to participate. And so obviously, this is a lot of you have seen Scratch as caged by the, the introduction. So we wanted something as easy as snapping Lego bricks together to be able to create your own games, stories, animations, art. So of those people who have seen Scratch, the application, how many of you have contributed or looked at the website? OK, that's also a lot of people. Uh, so for those who haven't seen it, there's this website, much like YouTube, where you can share your videos. The Scratch website is a space where people can share their interactive creations. And then any project on the website, you can interact with it, you can view it, you can, there's a social networking piece, you can see how many other people have viewed your project, how many people have loved it. But then a really important part of Scratch, and this is again related back to kindergarten, we love sharing. So anything that you post on the website, you can download, and it becomes a powerful opportunity to learn from what others have created. So here is that project that we were just looking at on the website. I download it. I can see all the bits and pieces that go into it and all the code. So I wanted to talk a bit about sort of its uptake. So there are more than 800,000 people who have registered for the site. Of those, more than 200,000 have created projects. This is the demographic of Scratch. So we're sort of like, our peak is at like 12. But there's this really long tail of participation. Now, some of that is actually adults participating in the Scratch online community. Some of this is self-report. So we have 99-year-olds in the Arctic who are you know, using Scratch. But there is an active adult community as well participating. People are using Scratch all around the world. It's very popular in England, as in the US, but it's being used elsewhere as well. So these are sort of where it was used last month. And then one last thing about scale, more than 1.8 project, 1.8 million projects have been shared by young people on the website. So there are two new projects on the website every minute. So if you ever have some time on your hands, the Scratch website always has some new content for you. So a question I'm often asked is, so what's interesting about the website? I mean, there's something interesting about scale, um, so the sheer number of things. But like, what, you know, Karen, what do you find interesting about the website? And so there are two aspects to the website that I wanted to talk about that I find particularly interesting. The first is diversity, and the second is collaboration that we've seen on the website. So let's start with diversity. So, this is a metaphor that my advisor and his advisor used to talk about design of technologies. So when you are creating a tool, you want something that has a low floor or a low threshold. It should be easy to get started. But you also want a high ceiling. So you should be able to create arbitrarily complex things with that tool. Now, a third dimension to this that is really important, particularly for the work that we do, is we want wide walls. So this is the diversity thing. You know, so there are some tools that are really, really fantastic. It's really easy to create things. It's really easy to get started. But there's only exactly one type of thing you can create. You can only create games, or you can only create stories, or you can only create fill in the blank. And so it was really important with Scratch that people be able to create a wide range of projects. And so I wanted to give you a sampling of some of my favorite projects on the website that I think demonstrate some of this breadth of uptake with Scratch. So this is a project that was created by a 13-year-old boy. And it's a music video in tribute of Halloween. 
So he drew these with the scratch paint editor and brought them to life with scratch. Little monster mash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. This is an epic project. I won't show you the whole thing, but it's five minutes. So he took the whole song and animated, and animated it. Again, sort of unexpected uses of Scratch for us. Uh, here is a project. I never know how to categorize it. I don't know if it's humor or if it's actually practical. It's an excuse generator. I couldn't give the CAS keynote because my hamster needed to be attacked, because my computer needed to be burnt because my spoon needed to be drilled, because my food needed to be run over. So who knows? This may be useful for you tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> Something more in the art space. So Brian Eno, create, the musician, created an iPhone app called Bloom, where you like poke the iPhone, and it plays back sounds in the sort of like artistic. You can tell I'm not an arts major. But this is, like, I think it's really beautiful. So a young person used Scratch to recreate that. So you use the mouse to click on the screen, and it highlights, it plays a tone, it highlights it, and it starts to play it back. So again, more artistic use of Scratch. It's kind of entrancing. Uh, games are super popular with Scratch. This is a game called Extreme Climbing. It's a rock climbing game. So this is a recording of me playing this game. I'm not very good at it. I'm always kind of embarrassed to show it. But you collect rings. There's timing. There's all sorts of things that you're doing in this game. Again, all of the drawings done in Scratch and brought to life with the Scratch blocks. This is a Scratch chatbot that a young person in Wisconsin created. He had seen a Nova episode about artificial intelligence, and he wondered how, how intelligent he could make Scratch through a chatbot. So I have this exchange with the chatbot. My name is Karen. It says, don't use any punctuation or capital letters. I say, OK, using capital letters. I follow instructions really well. I say, what? And I say, lowercase OK. What is your favorite color? I ask it. My favorite color is blue. What is your favorite animal? Dogs, of course. This is where I'm a big cat fan. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree. I asked it, how do you feel? What does that mean? <laughs> I say, never mind. It says OK. So again, really interesting exploration by a young person who just saw something on TV and was like, well, how could I relate this to what I'm interested in? This is a project created by a 14-year-old girl as part of a national STEM video game challenge in the US. And so this is, uh, you know, it's very Sims inspired. So you have an alien of your own, and you feed it, you make it get a job so it can earn money, so it can buy stuff, so it can have kids and pets. And we're constantly amazed by the ways in which we see Scratch stretched. So part of Scratch being stretched is the genres of projects. So we've seen art, we've seen stories, we've seen simulations, games, just in this short burst. But part of it is making that connection to the physical world still. So although there is some expense associated with connecting to the physical world, it's something we really love. And so I want to show you two extensions to Scratch that you might find interesting. So this is Scratch, which many of you know. And so the first extension, physical world extension I'm going to show you is the Pico board, the Scratch sensor board. I see Margaret at the back. She's waving right at the back. You're offering a Scratch sensor board workshop at 11.50. I'm doing a little promotion for Margaret. Uh, so the Scratch sensor board. And so you've got all sorts of different sensors on this board. So it's just connected to my machine via USB. So I've got a slider. I've got a light sensor. I've got a sound sensor. I've got a push button. I've got resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a little program that maps resistance to sound. So I'm going to get a forever block out, go to the sound category, and I'm going to have it play a particular note. OK. 
It's a very exciting soundtrack. So I'm going to go to sensing, and then I'm going to have the pitch vary with resistance. So I'm going to say resistance, drop that into the note. It's very high, right? Resistance is high. When they touch, resistance is low, the pitch is low. But now I can explore the world around me. And one thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to, I'm not thirsty, and I'm just going to pour some water on the table. Okay? So now I'm creating my own water based musical interface live in England. So the further away I am, the higher the resistance, the closer I get. But again, you could do this with anything. You could explore the resistance properties of bananas or dirt or <laughs> you know, anything you want. So again, exploring the world around you, but through scratch. So that's one thing I wanted to show you. Something else I wanted to show you, another extension to scratch is the we do. How many people have seen the we do? Fewer people. I've got some things to surprise you. So the Mindstorms kit was, as I mentioned, was very popular, but it was expensive. And Nicholas Negroponte, who was the head of the Media Lab, said, you know, if I can make, he was, you know, the one laptop per child, the XO, the $100 laptop. He said, if I can make a laptop for $100, he said this to Mitch, surely you and Lego could make a robotics kit for $10. And so Mitch was like, what? But we can try it. We can try and make a lower cost robotics kit. And that's what provoked, it's not $10, but um, it's not as expensive as Mindstorms. So you've got this lower cost robotics kit. You've got a controller. You've got two types of sensors. There's a proximity sensor and there's a tilt sensor. There's also a motor. So this is a project I like to call Friendly Gator. So, what we do does is expands the range of what you can create with Scratch. So you can do this transmedia storytelling, for example. So I've got an alligator. I've got something in the physical world. I also have something happening on screen. So let's see what happens. This is Gus. He's super friendly. But like many alligators, he's a bit misunderstood. A lot of people think he's scary. But not Kiki. Kiki got lost in transit. So we'll pretend that my iPhone is Kiki. And so as Kiki gets closer in person, she gets closer on screen. Oh no, watch out Kiki. Oh, he's actually very friendly. So he gives kisses, he doesn't bite. So again, you're expressing yourself, you're telling stories, but it just ex expands the range and maybe is appealing to a broader cross section of people. So. Diversity is one thing I find really interesting about Scratch. The other thing I find really interesting about Scratch is collaboration. So everything we know about learning, everything we know about creativity is that it's not an individual process. These are social processes. So whenever I see collaboration on the site, I'm really excited. And I wanted to give you a couple of examples of the ways in which we see this play out with young people in the community. So the first thing, as I mentioned, we have a lot of projects on the site. There's also this notion of remixing. When I download your project, I can change it. I can repost it to the site. But what's even more interesting is that the projects and remixes are completely dwarfed by the sheer number of comments that are on the website. So there's this very active conversation that's taking place between young people. And I wanted to give you a sample of this where young people are giving feedback to each other on each other's work. So this is a project, Switch It. It's a puzzle game where you're trying to move You've got an end state in the upper right-hand corner, and you've got a starting state, and you have to like swap the tiles to get it into the next state. So a young person posted this to the website. Someone else, so the creator is Silvershine, and the person giving feedback is Darth Pickley. So Darth Pickley says, a pretty easy puzzle, but fun. Silvershine says, thank you for playing. What do you think I could change to add a bit more of a challenge? He said, I couldn't even write this myself. Like, I love this. This is really exciting. Darth Pickley then gives all sorts of feedback about what you could do. Well, you could add an additional feature where you've got like a par, you know, what is like the minimum number of moves you can do. I was like, I love that. So again, it's a way of giving feedback to each other. That's one form of collaboration. 
We also see collaboration, as I mentioned, through remixing. So someone posted a version of Tetris, one of my all-time favorite games. So I try and put it into every presentation I can while still being respectable. So this is Tetris. This was an early version. You know, you've got a score. You've got black blocks that are falling down. Someone else came along and said, well, why don't we add color to the blocks? although everyone should know how to play Tetris. Let's add instructions. Let's give a hint for what the next block is. And then, because it's such a popular game, this is a, a rep visual representation of the derivative works. So you can see, like, okay, we started way back with Amy V, and then Fondi Biao remixed it. And then you see it, like, it just really splinters off in this interesting way. So, this is a form of collaboration that is a bit more diffuse. You know, people aren't collaborating on things, but we see explicitly to create something new. But we see that a lot on the website. So two teenage girls found each other on the website. One was a really strong programmer, one was a really strong animator. And the animator was just, you know, it was an artist, I guess I should say. She was drawing these beautiful pictures with scratch, but she was just drawing these static pictures. She was treating it like a paint editor. And this other girl said, these are amazing. Why don't you animate them? This is what scratch is for. You know, why don't you try to do that? She's like, well, I don't know how. And so they teamed up and, and eventually formed a 10-episode series about a superheroine named Jody, who's not doing very well in school. But this developed a huge fan base on the website. And the programmer learned more about narrative and art, and the artist learned more about programming. And she's now studying computer science at the college level. Another example of a collaboration, so that was just sort of a pair of people getting together. We also see these more elaborate collaborations being formed on the website. So an 8-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 13-year-old decided to form a production studio. They decided to start a company. One was the president, one was the head programmer, one was the, the lead artist. But they realized they wanted to create something bigger than the, just the three of them could create. And so they recruited 30 other kids on the website to create this project. Again, a tribute to Halloween. Halloween is really popular, apparently. So this is a project, Night at the Dreary Castle. And it's a choose-your-own-adventure style project. So do you open the door, do you run away, do you go in the basement, or do you go up the stairs? Do you, and this is like a huge, I've never finished it. I've never finished this game, it's epic. But again, sort of the power of collaboration with kids coming together to form something bigger than they could on their own. Speaking of bigger than they could on their own, kids are not just creating like scratch projects, they're also remixing scratch themselves. So this is the website for Panther. So kids were frustrated that they couldn't build their own blocks. Someone mentioned BYOB earlier. They were frustrated that they couldn't add their own blocks to scratch and they're like, if the scratch team is not gonna do it for us, we're gonna do it for ourselves. So they forked scratch and they called it Panther. And so you can download Panther and share your project. It's really awesome. You know, I love that. We're getting lots of ideas for Scratch 2.0 from Panther and projects like BYOB. So th these are some of the things I find interesting about Scratch. But how do we make this interestingness accessible to more young people? So I've done a lot of ethnographic work with young people on the website. And when I talk to them, I say, well, how did you get started with Scratch? And so they said, my mom told me, my dad showed it to me. Oh, what do they do? They're computer scientists. <laughs> They're engineers. These are kids who were probably going to have interesting technology experiences one way or another. So I argue that schools are a critical piece to broadening participation with Scratch. And we already see this happening, at least in the US. Scratch is being used in elementary schools. This was created by a fourth grader. This is a sort of a Sims virtual pet thing. You've got a little lizard. You feed it to keep it happy. You give it water, gets more energy. Uh, University of California, Los Angeles received funding from the National Science Foundation to really get Scratch out and exploring computer science in a big way. And so 900 in its first years, 900 African-American and Latino, Latina students have been reached with this program. 
Scratch is also being used at the college level. So Harvard uses it, Wisconsin Madison, Berkeley all use it as an introduction to computer science. And so you do like two weeks of Scratch and then you move on to Java or C or C++. <laughs> um, but this is something that someone like who is an artist who was interested in trying computer science, he drew pictures by hand, took photos of them, brought them into Scratch. Slightly different from my introduction to computer science. I was a computer science major. This is not what I was doing in my first week. Um, but it's so, so this is work from David uh, Malin at Harvard, and he found that it increased retention. So people who started this, they saw the numbers go way up in terms of people who persisted, but it also drew new people in. So how can you, you know, with Scratch, get access to these big ideas, but then move on to a different language when you've had this sort of like introduction to the big concepts? So if getting into schools is important, how do we do that? Uh, when I arrived at the group, I had just come from teaching pre-service teachers. So I was teaching teachers how to be teachers. And I was getting all the email from teachers. They're like, oh, Karen's here. We can just send the teacher email to her. And it, I was so excited. You know, I arrived in August 2007, and there were already so many awesome educators who were really engaged with Scratch. And they were doing four things in these emails. One, they were telling me the, their stories of what they were doing with Scratch, which was just fantastic. They, we weren't making resources, so they were creating their own resources and wanted to share them. Again, awesome. They were asking me questions, and they also wanted to answer questions, and they just wanted to connect with other educators. You know, it's events like these bring us together and to do interesting things. So I was like, this is not useful. You know, like, I am one person, and it would be so much better if, like, people could talk to each other rather than being mediated through me. So I built a website called Scratch Ed, and this was launched two summers ago. And more than 3,400 educators have joined where they can share their stories. So teachers are taking videos of their students and talking about their experiences. Again, educators are making excellent resources. A teacher in British Columbia in Canada made a textbook for upper elementary, middle school, and high school that he shared on the website. People are asking questions like, what are the worst scratch programming practices, which elicits a lot of a response. And again, people from all around the world are connecting. And so I just wanted to like highlight this part of the world to show there are a lot of people who are working with Scratch. And these are just people who have opted in to have their location made visible. So this is one way in which we're interested in supporting teachers. We're also doing monthly webinars. So if you are free the fourth Monday of the month, you can check out these webinars we're hosting where Mitch and I talk about Scratch and get educators to come talk about Scratch. Those are also all recorded and shared on Scratch Ed. We also do a lot of in-person workshops. So at the Media Lab, we really want teachers to have the types of learning experiences that their kids are, will hopefully be having, which leads me to how you can get involved. This is my call to arms. So. <laughs> If you haven't already, although a bunch of you seem to have, try Scratch. <laughs> and so I also wanted to give you a little like preview of Scratch 2.0. I asked Mitch if this is okay. He said it was okay. Um, and, but this is like pre-alpha alpha, you know, like pre-pre-alpha. So this is Scratch 2.0. And one of the things, as I mentioned, I find so interesting is collaboration, but it's kind of kludgy with Scratch. It's not as easy as it could be to take assets from other people and share it. So with Scratch 2.0, you can author online and access all of these projects online. So I'm looking at this project. I love what she's done with this visual piece. And we've added this notion of the backpack. So you can go look at a project, take a code excerpt, take a visual element, put it in your backpack, move over to another project that you're working on. You're like, OK, I like these robots piece. I took the bird from the other project, I can look in my backpack and I can drag it in. So to make it much easier, right now it's really awkward to move pieces between projects, as some of you may know. So how can we make it even easier to remix, reuse pieces of projects? Another thing in my call to arms, uh, explore Scratch Ed. If you haven't checked it out already, we'd love to see you there. So that's a place where hopefully you can find resources to go deeper with Scratch. Again, attending events. Uh, one event that we sort of facilitate is Scratch Day. Did anyone participate in Scratch Day this year? 
Not all at once. OK, so Scratch Day, you might be able to do this next year. This is an international network of events. There were 126 events in 36 countries this year. And so these are places where people are just getting together and getting kids together, getting teachers together, getting parents together. And I'll give you a taste of what we did at our event at MIT. So we had more than 400 people come to the Media Lab and hang out. So Mitch led this real-time programming thing. So he programmed the audience. <laughs> We had opportunities for kids to work with Pico boards and we do. So this is the construction zone. Again, it's so, you know, we're in lifelong kindergarten, but we don't get to spend all that much, as much time as we'd like with kids. So this is our day to like load up on kids interacting with Scratch, which is really cool. We're also big on reflection. How can you go deeper and reflect on your experiences? It's not just about having the experiences, but thinking about it. So my favorite thing about Scratch is that it's free. And then we're really big on show and tell, or bring and brag, as it was called last night. And so we, had, like, we were flooded. We were totally overwhelmed with the number of kids who wanted to get up and share with other kids what they had been doing on, doing with Scratch. There's also a hacker space. So a lot of ki these kids who want to do derivatives of Scratch itself and look at, at Scratch 2.0. So that's a taste. And all that documentation was prepared by the kids. We put flip cams in their hands, and they ran around and asked people about their experiences with Scratch. And so my last call to arms is we need to empower kids to be creators. You know, We need to support them as computational creators to engage them in this creative learning spiral. So together, we can enable young people to see how broad and exciting the field of computing is. And so if I started the talk with unaware, this is the other extreme, being unaware of computing to seeing computing everywhere. This is a young, an 11-year-old who talked about his experiences with Scratch. I love Scratch. Wait, let me rephrase that. Scratch is my life. I have made many projects. Now I have what I call a programmer's mind. That is where I think about how anything is programmed. This has gone from toasters, car electrical systems, and so much more. So together, we can help build this excitement. Together, we can move from unaware to everywhere. Thank you.